Hello, dear ladies and gentlemen. Welcome each and everyone from each corner of the world. Welcome to the ITTF HPD webinar series, webinar number 16, with the topic 2020 ITTF International Empire Exam Feedback, Rules and Regulations Analysis. This is Ramon Ortega Montes, the ITTF Head of Education. Today we have two amazing speakers, both match officials and both officials. But before I introduce them, let me do in some housekeeping. We are going to record the webinar. Please keep yourself all time mute and turn off the video. Please don't press anything related to the webinar recording or to the presentation PowerPoint slides control. And last but not least, write down all your questions in the chat section at the right of your screen. Panelists will try to answer as many as possible in the questions and answer part of the webinar. And now enjoy the webinar. Let me introduce the two panelists. Graeme Island from Australia, ITTF Hello. Technical Commissioner and International Referee. Hello, Graeme. Hello, everybody. Constantina Crota from Greece, Para Table Tennis Committee Chair and International Referee Advance. Welcome, Constantina. Hello, everybody. Hello. So, as in previous occasions, this webinar is not only the webinar itself, but also useful educational material to be used for the next editions of the International Empire Exam as a, and as educational material for the member associations, a part of the feedback for the International Empire Exam. Graham, you are the ITTF Commissioner, of course, also international referee since 1996, correct? Correct. Not only your referee career as match official, referee and deputy referee in Olympic Games, World Championships, but also as official, you are the jury chair for Tokyo 2020, even if in 2021, and you were jury and or technical delegate in different Olympic Games, London, Rio, and also in Youth Olympic Games, Nanjing and Buenos Aires. And if still not enough, you were jury chair in the last 10 World Championships editions, so you have seen more of the last year's international empires, the white batch empires, and also you have, you are, sorry, advisor of the international empire exam in URC in the last eight editions. Who better than you to explain rules and regulations details? Graeme, floor is yours. Thank you, Moncho. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everybody. Um, as you can see from that, you know, I've got fair amount of uh, history and knowledge of the rules. So during the, the presentation, I will be giving examples and just about all of them are paraphrases of exam questions. Okay, next. Uh, just a brief history of the IU exam. It started in 1973. And since 1982, it's been happening every second year. Um, in the past, it's been a hard copy exam. Um, it's a fixed set of 50 questions. Everybody got the same exam. It was all under the control of the URC. The member associations could translate it into whatever language they wanted. Um, you had a specific time, two or three months, to do the exam. You sent the results in to ITTF. The exams were marked. And about four months later, a list of new IUs was published. In 2018, for example, there were about 1,200 candidates from 90 associations. This year, things changed completely. It was an online exam. You got the result immediately. and whether you were, became an IU or not. Uh, it was only available in 10 languages. We translated everything. 
the association registered everybody and it came under the education department, which Mon chose for the head. Um, there was still a set of 50 questions, but these came from a bank of several hundred questions. So every exam was different. Um, there were, as I said, a bank of um, several hundred questions. They were split into different blocks of different rules or regulations. And they were also sort of categorised into whether they were easy or hard or just average questions. So even though everybody got a different exam, they were all roughly similar you know, as to how hard they were. Um, another thing you would have noticed in the past that there were 40 multiple choice questions and 10 situation questions. Um, you may not have noticed this year that happened again, it's just that the questions were all interspersed. So you would have seen at least 10 questions that said point to A, point to X, let or take no action. They're the situation questions. Um, this year we had 875 candidates. We expected more, but with the pandemic going on, uh, we lost a few, but there were 99 associations involved. And as it sees down the bottom, we've had nearly 8,000 IUs qualified since 1973. Next. OK, in the past, candidates can be any age. There's been several instances of 15 year old international umpires. You had to have several years national experience. Once you become an international umpire, you're an international umpire for life and there was no practical, you just had to be, know the rules and pass the exam. Now, the minimum age is 20. You have to have two years officiating at national level. In the future, there will be a refresher course and exam that you will have to undertake to maintain your active status. And you will have to officiate at at least one event, ITTF event every three years. Uh, when the exam went out, the recommended preparation was the handbook, chapters two and three, the handbook for match officials, the umpire training videos on the ITTF URC web page. It would have also been a good idea if you'd talk to other experienced IUs in your association or other candidates and study together. Uh, next. Uh, and this were the instructions for the exam answer the questions exactly as they are presented. Don't add or presume anything. Read the entire question. Read all the possible answers. Select the best choice, even if you believe there's more than one correct answer. There was never more than one correct answer, even though there were some very similar answers. Um, and in the questions, it was very important to take note of the words. Must, shall, can, should, could because they all mean slightly different. Now I'll just give everybody a simple question, true or false? Players must leave their rackets on the table between games. This I suspect that most of you would say, or at least two thirds of you would say that was true. And in the exam, that was about what happened. However, the word must is not correct because in regulation 3425 it says unless otherwise authorized by the umpire players must players should so th the aim there is to make sure you read the questions and take note of the words whenever you see the word must you want to be very sure that it applies in every circumstance um, the next thing is to analyze what happens what 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 action has happened you know, is the rally over? Anything that says the point is decided. So another example there, I'll just give you a simple example. In a singles match against X, as A makes a good return, he slips and falls onto the floor. X makes a good return. So you had three choices, a point to A, a point to X would do nothing. And most people said award a point to X. But in the question, there's actually nothing to say. 
that the rally was over. There's nothing to say that A didn't get up off the floor and return the shot. So therefore, no action is the correct answer. Right, next. There were several areas where it was obvious you know, weaknesses in, in the answers. And so they're the ones that we will cover tonight. I will cover the first five and Tina, who's the para expert, will cover the para TT. Okay, the first one next. The first thing we're going to look at is equipment and clothing and the racket. So the main thing about the racket, this is all covered in regulation or law 2.4, is that the blade can be any size or shape. Nothing to say how thick it's got to be or anything else. The rubber. You have to need to understand the difference between pimpled rubber and sandwich rubber. Pimpled rubber is rubber without sponge and the pimples are out. Sandwich rubber is anything with sponge and the pimples in or out. Um, but again, only the side of the blade, which is used for striking the ball, has to have an authorised rubber on it. The other side can be anything as long as it's the opposite colour, black or bright red. Um, but everything is covered in law 2.4. Clothing, um, the main thing here is that the main colour has to be different to the ball and opposing players or pairs have sufficiently different colours to enable them to be easily, easily distinguished by spectators. For example, if you've got a doubles pair, um, one pair wearing red shirts and the other pair has one red and one blue, that's fine. They're easily distinguishable by spectators to which pair is which. So here, uh, Graham, sorry, we see two girls, two players, female players with same country, different color, playing doubles. Yes. Is that allowed? Uh, yes, this was the next thing I was going to cover, is that you also need to be aware of rule changes. Uh -huh. So the rules changed last year in the doubles pairs only have to be dressed uniformly at World, Olympic and Paralympics, not at other ITTF events. Aha, uh -huh. now I see. Okay, so, thank you. So, well, you know, th this was a question in the exam. When they arrive for a doubles match, X and Y are wearing blue shirts, A is red and B is yellow. And A, B, so they're from different associations that they have to wear their own association shirt. Now, two years ago, the correct answer would have been allow that because they're from the same, they're from different associations. However, with the rule change, the association is irrelevant. So you just allow it anyway. You don't even have to refer it to the referee. OK. And, you know, as I said, again, about two thirds gave the wrong answer, but two years ago it would have been right. So be aware of rule changes. Uh, advertisements, again, the, the regulation is listed there. On clothing, you know, all you have to be aware of is the number allowed and where they're placed. So you wouldn't allow six advertisements on the front of a shirt, for example. On the surrounds, oh, sorry, the, the other thing is that, again, a recent change last year, um, the alcohol advertisements are now allowed on a limited basis. Certainly not for junior events or where the local culture doesn't allow it, but it is allowed. Um, on the surround, for example, you can have LEDs, but they can't change from dark to light. On the surrounds, you can only have two colours. They have to be different to the ball within a maximum height of 40 centimetres. Now, the reason that umpires have to be aware of this is because normally they're the ones that see, see it first and they have to, if it's not right, they have to bring it to the attention of the referee. Next. Uh, definitions. This is one of the important areas that everybody needs to study and should know. You know simple one, a rally. A rally is just a period during which the ball's in play. 
and it's in play from the start of the service until it's decided is either a let or a point. Again, to understand this, I'll give a, an example. Uh, a serves in the first point of the match and it's a, it's a service let. The score is still 0-0. Zero, zero. Can a player call a timeout at that stage or can they decide to have expedite? Now, a lot of people would say no because no points have been scored, but a rally has been played. Even though it was a let, it was a rally. So someone can call a timeout at 0, zero if the first service was a let. Uh, the racket hand and the free hand. Again, simple. The racket hand is the hand carrying the racket. The free hand is the hand not carrying the racket. Normally, a player has one racket hand and one free hand. But a player can have two racket hands. You know, I think we've all seen examples or pictures of players holding the racket in both hands. That's fine. In that case, they have two racket hands and no free hand. Hugo Calderano, yeah. for example. Yep, well, players, players use, often use it on the, on the back end. They actually put both hands when they're playing a back end. They play their forehand normally and a bit like tennis. On the back end, they play double-handed. Mm -hmm. um, but a free hand, if I said, do you have to have a racket hand, I suspect most of you would say, yes, you must have a racket hand. But again, an example here, um, a returns the ball and drops the racket on the floor and as he's bending over to pick it up he puts the hand that he was holding the racket in on the table. In that case it's a point to his opponent because at that point in time he doesn't have a free a racket hand. Both hands are free hands. So you can have and normally it's one racket hand, one free hand, but you can have two racket hands or no racket hands. Uh, strikes. Again, this is a simple uh, definition. It strikes the ball if you touch it in play with the racket held in the with the racket held in the hand or the racket hand below the wrist. So, if you have a legal racket in your hand, you can strike the ball with any part of the racket, accidentally or deliberately, as long as the racket is legal. Uh, the next one which confuses people is obstruct and again the definitions there player obstructs the ball if he or anything he, he or she wears or carries touches it in play when it's above or traveling towards the playing surface. Um, I'll give you an example in a minute but people think that players getting in each other's way is obstruction. You know, if a player accidentally or on purpose stops the other player from uh, playing a shot, that is not an obstruction. It's a let and it's either, if it's accidental, it's just a let. If it's deliberate, it's a let and point, you know, either a yellow card or call the referee, but it's not a point. And the last definition you need to be aware of is wears or carries. So wears or carries includes anything that he or she was wearing or carrying, obviously apart from the ball, at the start of the rally. Uh, an example of that, players wearing a watch, it falls off, lands on the table, the opponent returns the ball and it hits the watch. In that case, it's an appoint to the opponent because the, play, the ball has been obstructed. It's hit something over the table that the player was wearing or carrying at the start of the rally. Uh, next. Expedite. Um, this doesn't occur very often these days, certainly not as often as it used to occur when we played up to 21 points in 15 minutes, but it does occur. Rio Olympics, we one match went into expedite. So you need to be aware of it and understand it. So in summary, it only comes into play after 10 minutes unless at least 18 points have been scored. 
But if both players think it's going to go to expedite or they've played each other many times before and know it always goes to expedite, they can request it earlier. When the next server is one you need to know, if the ball is in play when time is called, then the player who served in that rally serves again. If the ball is not in play, then the receiver in the previous rally serves. So it's pretty straightforward. Just remember, if, the, if it's interrupted in the middle of the rally, the server doesn't lose the advantage of serve and serves again. Uh, when expedite starts, a stroke counter is needed. Normally, this is a separate official, but it can be the assistant umpire. But it's important to know that a stroke counter only counts the receiver's strokes. So in effect, they stand looking at the receiver, and as soon as the receiver strikes the ball, they just count. The receiver, if the receiver makes 13 good returns, and it's up to the umpire to determine whether it's a good return, not the stroke counter, then the receiver wins the point. Uh, once expedite is introduced, players alternate serves for the rest of the match, and it stays until the rest of the match. Um, this is very well covered in the Handbook of Match Officials, um, section 15, and the duties of the stroke counter and where they stand or sit and how they count is covered in section 4.5. Next. The penalty system. It's covered in the handbook for match official 17.3 with a number of examples. It comes in as a result of misbehaviour. Now, we're not going to cover misbehaviour tonight because that was covered in the previous webinar for officials number six, which happened in early June. And later, Moncho can tell you how to access that. The point, so the point penalty system actually covers two things. It covers cards and it also covers penalty points. So the first card that a player gets is either, it's often said a warning is a yellow card. So no point is invoked, but the player knows that they're on a warning. If they do misbehave again, then they will have a point will be awarded to their opponent. So, when you if you misbehave again, then the umpire shows a yellow and red card, and awards a point to the opponent for the first one. If it happens again, yellow and red again, and two points to the opponent. So, as you can see, it's both cards and points. Now, the other thing to understand is that in an individual match, points carry forward. So, in effect, any unused points are transferred to the next game of that match. So, that the next match, next game starts at one love or two love um, or zero one or zero two, depending on who's serving. So, I'll just give a simple example of how that works. So let's say A served first in the match and in his first game he misbehaves and he's giving a war given a warning, yellow card. Again in that game, he misbehaves. So his opponent is awarded a penalty point. In the second game at 8-10, A serving and he intentionally breaks the ball. So in that case, the umpire, of course, it's his second one. He has to award two penalty points. But X only needs one penalty point for the game. So, in effect, he gets one penalty point to win that game. And the start of the next game, he also gets a penalty point. So A serves because it's a third game with a score at 0-1 and only gets one serve. Uh, so... Um... Green. Yes. Uh, sometimes here is related the the worms. What a worm means? What, when what a player it, is warned. A warn. A, a warning is just a yellow card. So uh -huh. so it's, it's a warning. There's no point involved. There's no penalty point 
involved. It's a warning to say that if you misbehave again, your opponent will get a point. Thank there, you. There is, there is also an unofficial warning, which is covered in the handbook for match officials, which sometimes happens to, you know, if a player is sort of getting a bit upset, it often diffuses the situation, just a, a friendly unofficial warning. But an official warning is a yellow card. Okay, thank you. Okay, now in team matches, cards carry forward. So, uh, so the warnings and penalties are carried over to subsequent individual matches. Uh, a doubles pair carries the higher of any warning or penalties incurred by either of the players. So, for example, if one had been worn in a previous match, the yellow card, in other words, and the other had incurred a penalty point, a yellow red, a first offence by either of them in the doubles match would incur two penalty points because they've gone into the match with a penalty point hanging over their heads. But the warning or in that penalty in that doubles match or only applies to the player who misbehaved. So, as I said in that example, you know, if A had gone in with a yellow card and B had gone in with a yellow red and B misbehaved, coming out of the match, B would have two penalty points hanging over his head because he's misbehaved twice. A would still only have the yellow card, even though the doubles pair had had the two penalty points. Okay, uh, so because in that case, you know, B would have offended twice and, o, and A hasn't had a penalty point at all. Is that clear, Moncho? Any questions about that one? We, we, we might get some questions later. Okay, yes, we will have some questions in questions and answers later, yes. apart of the different scenarios. <laughs> yep. Okay, next, service. Um, again, this is covered in 2.6, but quickly going through it, the ball must be thrown near vertically upwards from the open palm of the service free hand so that it rises at least 16 centimetres. It's struck when it's falling, so it first touches the service court and then the receiver's court. From the start of service until it's struck, the ball must be above the level of the playing surface and behind the service end line. Must not be hidden by the receiver, by any part of the body or clothing of the server or the doubles part or his doubles partner. Now, one of the questions in the exam that a lot of people got wrong said the free hand while in contact with the ball and at the instance of projecting upwards shall be behind the server's end line, above the playing surface, etc. The reality is that there's nothing in the definition about the service free hand. It's only the ball has to be behind the line. So a lot of people said, yes, the service free hand has to be above the level of the playing service and behind the service end line, which was wrong. So this is another one where you must read the question. It referred, the question asked about the service free hand, not the ball. All right, and the last one there is uh, a warning. You know, it's a player's responsibility to serve so that the umpire or assistant umpire is satisfied that the service is correct. The umpire or the assistant umpire can give a warning if, they, if it's a doubtful service. Certainly not if it's an illegal service. There's no warning for an illegal service. And, you know, you can relax the requirements if you know, there's a valid reason to do so, and Tina will cover that uh, in the para questions, uh, which are coming up now. So I'll hand over to pa to Tina. Thank you very much, Graeme. Amazing pieces of advice and also of information that you gave us to any, not only those who did the international umpire exam this year, but also to any umpire. A very Amazing information. Thank you very much. So, apart of all those things that Graham was talking about, we have also uh, in the International Empire exam, and now in any level, the para table tennis. 
So, Constantina, Tina, you are international referee advance since 2019, the second promotion of the advance, with experience in many world championships, like Hamstad 2018, Suso 2015, as the PT referee, and in para world championships, like Bratislava 2017, as referee, a part of World Cups and World Tour Grand Finals referee, and in the Paralympic Games Tokyo 2020 and European Championships, you are TD, Technical Delegate. We wanted someone with a lot of experience in the field and also knowing very well the para rules. And you also cover the official part as you are the chair of the Para Table Tennis Committee. So, Tina, please explain us the laws of para and tell us also where to find them. Tina. Okay, Over hello you. everybody. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Moncho. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us. We will try to explain some of the para regulations and then to see some scenarios, and if we have some time to um, answer some of your questions. So, next, please. So let's start uh, to um, make first the presentation of the regulation about when a service is a let. So when the receiver is in a wheelchair and the service is, of course, otherwise correct, then be careful in singles and doubles. So in service, the ball comes to rest on the receiver's court as a, a as you can see in table one, or after touching the receiver's court returns in the direction of the net, as you can see in the table two. But only in singles, and I repeat, only in singles, when leaves the receiver's court after touching it by either of its sidelines. Next, please. So we also must pay attention if the receiver strikes the ball before it crosses a sideline or takes a second bounce on his her side of the playing surface, then the receiver is then the service is considered good. So what do we have to pay attention in this regulation and what are the key words of this regulation? First of all, we have to see if it is a singles match or a doubles match. And then we have to pay attention and to see if the receivers strikes the ball before the ball passes the sideline or after passes the sideline. If the receiver strikes the ball before um, passes the sideline, then it's um, it's, it, the service is considered good and then we are taking no action. And in singles, I repeat, if it passes the sideline and then he strikes the ball, then we have a let. And this is very, very important in your questions when you are taking your exams. So doubles or single match? When it passes the sideline or it doesn't pass the sideline? But this regulation is not valid for the doubles match. Next, please. Now let's explain and see the keywords for the regulation about contact with table. So the most important things that you have to know is that the rack and hand touches the table to restore balance only after a shot has been played. Okay, and your free the free hand of the player cannot touch the surf the playing surface at any time. So as you can see in the upper picture, the player touches the table in order to restore his balance, but after striking the ball. And in the lower picture, you can see the player that is touching with his free hand the playing surface. So this is 
not correct. Next, please. Let's see uh, now and explain the regulation about contact with wheelchair. So what do we have to pay attention here? So the player must maintain a contact with the seat or the cushion with the rear side of at least one of the thighs. And these have to be before striking the ball. And of course, both players must be, or players or pairs must be in wheelchair. So one of the thigh and before striking the ball. This is very important. Next sometimes, please. Yes, Dina, sorry. sorry. Sometimes yes. they have very long track suits or, or the, the, the trousers. So that is counting also? No, it's the thigh. It's the thigh if it is, uh, we have contact with the thigh. Okay. Uh -huh. It's not Thank a matter you. if it is a long uh, track shoot or not. Okay. Thank you. So let's see we about uh, standing para players with walking sting, stick. As you can see, the, the word here, the key word is standing. So uh, there are no exceptions to the laws of table tennis for standing players that have a disability. So all players, they are playing according to the laws and regulations of ITTF. So what it means there? So if there are any, uh, let's say for standing para players, any uh, relaxed service requirements only, then this must be written in their classification card. This classification card, the player must have it and uh, uh, he has to show it in the um, umpire or to the referee when they are asking for it. So a standing play para player is with a walking stick. If he falls down, okay, that means nothing and we are taking no action and the rally must continue. Uh, continue yeah, ma'am. Sorry. Uh, now I think that we have some scenarios or um, yes, know, thank, thank, yes you. thank you. Thank you very much, Tina. Uh, very useful because many of the candidates and also when they did the registration, many were asking about the para uh, table tennis, the competition, the rules. And just one question because many are asking yes. where are the manuals or where are those rules? Where are the books in which those rules are? Okay, if find? you're going to see the handbook of March officials, I think it's Appendix G. You can find Appen everything. A a a appendix G H. 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 Sorry, yeah. H. It's, you can find everything. Yeah, there. It's everything included there. So you cannot go to see many chapters of the handbook, but you can see everything there. So everything is in the handbook, in the laws and regulations. Thank you very much, Tina. Very useful. Yes. If I can just say, it, the actual regulations are in the laws and the regulations for table tennis. The explanation is all in the handbook of match officials. Match officials, exactly. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, very good. So within those two. I want to uh, answer. Yes. Uh, I would like to know that if the player. Uh, racket hand after striking the ball touches the table. Excuse me, excuse me. Uh, any participant, mute okay. your uh, mic and switch off your camera. Write down in the chat your questions, please. Okay? At the end, in questions and answers, we will have time to answer questions. Thank you very much. So we go to the next part. Next part is related different scenarios and as many of you participants of the International Empire exam were asking about some questions that how is possible to do this or what the answer is. 
So we prepare different scenarios for you to see how the, the information is coming and what the answers should come. So now we go to the first different scenarios. So Graham, again, the floor is yours. Thank you. So let's have a look at the first scenario. So these are, we've got five scenarios and they're actually questions from the, that some of you wouldn't would have seen. So as it says, doubles pair A and B are from different associations and speak different languages. Each player has a separate advisor. In the first game, A's advisor is warned for illegal advice during the game. During the next game, B's advisor signals B what surf to use. So what should the umpire do? Next, please. So should he give B's advisor a warning? Uh, no, because both advisors are treated as a single unit. The reference is 3512 if you're interested. Next. Show B's advisor a red card and require him to leave. Again, no, because they're treated as a pair. You can't just send one advisor away. Next. Um, several years ago, this would have been the correct answer. Show a red card to both advisors because they're treated as a pair and require both to leave the area. However, with the change of the rules to allow advice, next please. Take no action because giving advice during a game between rallies is legal. So, you know, telling your player which serve to serve, as long as it's between rallies, that's fine. And you, the umpire does nothing. So again, this is a recent change in rules when advice is now allowed at any time except between rally, except during rallies. Okay, scenario two, next please. X fails to make a good return and the umpire awards a point to A. X protests that A accidentally struck the ball twice and A agrees, although the umpire does not think he did so. So the umpire should award. Next, a let because the umpire is not certain, uh, definitely not. The point's over, the rally's over, so you, you don't replay it just because the umpire is not certain. Next, the point to A because the decision once made cannot be changed. Again, that's not correct. If the umpire makes a mistake, of course they can change their decision. Next, a point to X because both players agree that the original decision was wrong and the umpire is not certain. Again, the umpire doesn't change his call because he's not certain and both players agree. Often he does, but that's not, you know, if the umpire is certain that of what he saw, then even if both players agree, the umpire sticks with his call. But in this case, again, it's a recent rule change. Next, please. It's a point to A because an accidentally hitting the ball more than once is fine. It's only deliberately striking the ball. The right punter is awarded a point. So in this case, awarding the point to A was correct, even though it was a double hit. Right, scenario three. Again, this is one I talked about earlier the blade of the racket. Next. Can be covered on the side used for striking the ball with pimpled rubber, with pimples in or out. As I explained earlier, pimpled rubber is only pimples out. So that one's obviously incorrect. Next. Must be flat and rigid and not more than four millimetres thick. Um, there's nothing to say how thick the blade can be. It can be any size or shape. Certainly has to be flat and rigid. Okay, must be covered on both sides with sandwich or pimpled rubber, with one side black and the other bright red. This was the most popular answer, but again, it's incorrect. It doesn't have to be covered on both sides with sandwich rubber. It can be covered on the stri on a side not used for striking the ball with anything as long as it's black or bright red. Must it's work. Must, yeah, see so this. Two, two of those things have the word must, 
and that's always should be a red flag when you're doing an exam. And the next, the next, please. And as it says, it can be covered on a side. It doesn't say must. It just says it can be covered on a side used for striking the ball with sandwich rubber with pimples in or out. And as I explained earlier, that's the definition of sandwich rubber. It's got a sponge with pimples in or out. So that, that's just three scenarios where, or three questions, exam questions that a lot of people didn't get the right answer. So now we have a couple of para scenarios, so I'll hand back to Tina. Yes, thank Tina, you. now is your turn. Thank you. Next, please. So we have scenario four in a wheelchair singles match A serves to X. In an otherwise good service and after the ball passes the sideline of X, A returns the ball with a heavy toss pin. A fails to make a good return. The empire shoot. Next. Can I have please all three um, replies? I would like to show you how easy it is some of the questions if you are understanding the regulation. As we said before, we explained before, what are the keywords? Okay, we are first going to see if it is a singles match or a doubles match. So now the keyword here that is a singles match. And then we have to see if the receiver is striking the ball before passes the sideline or after passes the sideline. And here he strikes the, the, the ball after passes the sideline. So immediately you know the reply that is declare elect, as we say before. That is sometimes if you know, if you understand the regulation, it is very simple to reply. Next, please. So now we have another scenario. Let's say in a wheelchair doubles match, player A serves. After the otherwise correct service, which bounces on the right sideline of X court, the ball leaves the court. The empire shoot can have again all the four replies, and I will show you how easy it is if you understand the regulation. Again, what is the keyword? Doubles in a wheelchair, doubles match. And then what is saying? That the service, that he, after, after the otherwise correct service with bounces on the right sideline of X court, the ball leaves the court. But we have a wheelchair doubles match that le that means that we are taking no action sometimes it's very easy the reply if you understand the question correctly if you know the keywords thank you thank you tina very much from those different scenarios and now we go to the question and answers so part so some of the questions uh, will be answered or by Graham or by me because we were the ones uh, managing the international empire directly or from uh, URC or from um, ITTF staff. So just um, Yumiko Morikawa from Japan was asking that the languages of the exams change for many languages to only 10, but there is not compulsory English questions in the exam that uh, from those candidates that they didn't take the English exam. So yes, that is true. And this uh, time there were only 10 different languages and there were no English questions, but we go to the future and in the future there will be also English questions for anyone doing the exam even if there are different uh, languages. So the next one is um, for Tina. So can a para player ask for a personal time for an existing injury? 
Okay, there is a, a med medical recovery time. So, um, so a player with disability can ask for uh, some for a break before of his disability, and then the. Um, uh, of course, uh, we have to, after consulting a medical, let's say, classifier or a doctor, uh, we can allow um, a medical recovery of um, a maximum of 10 minutes. And this is uh, written even in the handbook of match officials in 13.5.4. Uh, so we can allow it only for um, his disability and the recovery of I mean, maximum for 10 minutes. Okay, thank you very much. So we hope that Lenore Roder from Australia, that is the one that was doing this question, already have the information. Just related uh, misbehavior because Graham, there were many, many questions talking about the, you were talking about the point penalty system, and there were many questions about the cards, yellow, red, and misbehavior. So where can we find this information? Um, the, the best, I mean, it's in the regulations, but the best place is in the handbook for match officials. And I'll just see if I can quickly find the reference. Um, This is a lot, there's a lot of examples there in the handbook for match officials. So in the match officials, there are the, the explanations related to it, correct? Yes, yes, certainly there's the explanations and examples. Okay, good. So now we come to another question that is related um, logistical. So it, it, it's in section 17 of the of the handbook for match officials. I can't give an exact reference, but certainly section, section 17. 17. Okay. 17. Behavior. 17. Yes. Good. So just related, uh, Ben Footy from Gersey uh, was asking if the pass rate increase or decrease from 2018. Uh, no, it was the same. Yes, exactly numbers. We have a pass rate in 2018, it was 43%, and pass rate in 2020, it was 40%. Yep. Good. So... Can I ask a question? Excuse me, participants, please write your question down in the chat that you have on the right. Write your questions. Switch off your mic, mute, and your camera, please. I'm not getting my... Uh, um, excuse me, participant, please switch mute and switch off your camera. Tina, uh, is there a time limit when the wheelchair is broken during the match? This question is coming from Natsuko Taniguchi from Japan. Um, no, there is no time limit and there is nothing written in the handbook or on the handbook of match officials, nothing. So there is no time limit. Okay. So next question is coming from Win Howe from Australia. He's asking, could be an online course to all potential international umpires examination candidates in the future? That is, that is mine, because we already, with the new strategic plan, we develop uh, the educational system. This year, it was the first part, is the, it's only the examination, but in the future, there will be also online education. So there will be uh, different chapters with different quizzes, and once you pass the different chapters, you will have this uh, final international umpire exam. And that will be the online part, because later there will be also a face-to-face -face part. So that will be, it will be blended learning. That means a part that is online and a part that it is on site. Good. So we have another one for you, Tina. Many questions from Para. <laughs> So this, this one is coming from Asko Rasinen from Finland. 
if a wheelchair has four wheels, mm -hmm. two large and two small in the front, and one of the small ones in the front gets loose, which rule, which rule we apply here? Okay, um, about the wheelchairs, um, in the regulation is written that must have at least two large and one small wheel. So if they have uh, two and two, they are okay because it's at least the word that we have to pay attention. And then um, if for any reason during the rally, um, in, um, there are conditions that, uh, uh, let's say, a wheel is broken, uh, and then um, if we are not having at least two or one, so the rally must be stopped and then a point must be award awarded to the opponent. But this is when we have only three, uh, two and one wheels. So if we have four and one is broken, then there is no problem, no action. <laughs> no action. Again, this is covered in Appendix H of the Handbook for Match Officials. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the next one perhaps is for you, Graeme, because many uh, participants were asking that why in the International Empire exam this year there were no questions related um, um, taking different situational questions. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, there were at least 10 situational questions in every exam. It's just that they weren't all together at the end. They were interspersed throughout the exam. So the questions were randomised and also the answers were randomised. So you didn't get the answer point to A, point to X. You could have got, you know, declare a let point to A, no action, point to X. But they all, all, there are still the 10 questions there about the situations. It's just that they weren't all together. Thank you very much. So we have still uh, one question from Isabel Vermeer from Belgium. And the question is how to avoid candidates cheating? Because this year people were doing the exam online and due to the COVID-19, many needed to do the exam at home. So how to avoid this? I'm taking this one, okay? Um, just to give three examples from three different member associations that they were doing during this year. Uh, one is China. They had many candidates and they, they had some supervisors and they took five candidates doing the exam with a like a webinar chat with Zoom, and they needed to have with the phone them doing the exam. So they were checked, so it's not possible to cheat. Another example is uh, Egypt. In the case of Egypt, they were going to a big venue with separation. They had a electricity connection. They were with uh, tablets or they were with, with uh, computer laptops, and they were doing the exam. And the last one is from Poland. They were all together in a room with the social distancing and doing their exam all together. So this is three examples that we can do. But in any case, as we said, this is the first part. And in the future, we are planning to have two or three more things to avoid cheating. Can, can, can I just add, if I can just add something. In yes. the past, there were definite examples of cheating where you would have six people from the same association with identical answers where they got the hard ones right and the easy ones wrong. So there was obviously collusion or cheating um, and in the past, but you know, that was when everybody had exactly the same exam. Uh, and in that example with six of them, they, they all failed anyway, so the instructor didn't know what they were doing. But this year with everybody doing a different exam, you, know, you can't ring up your mate and say, you know, what did you get for question 10? Because it'll be a different question. So, and, and it's, it's easy to see, you know, if someone takes 35 minutes to do the exam, they're not cheating. They haven't got time to look up reference books or anything else. Good. Thank you, Graeme. 
Uh, Tina, we have one more from Para for you. So this okay. one, I told you that there are many from Para. All participants were asking a lot about Para, and it really is very good because uh, in the future there will be many tournaments that will have able body and also Para. So and as we said that it will be compulsory to to be officiating in Para events. So it's good that they have these questions. So this question is coming from Antonio Perez from Spain, wheelchair player to hit a height ball, fails, but before the ball falls and after touching the table with the racket hand, manages to make a return that is initially correct. What will happen there? But uh, this is what we, <laughs> yes, we explain in our, um, our um, let's say, in our presentation before, so if the racket hand is uh, touching, um, uh, the racket hand can touch touching uh, the, play, the surface, the table, only after striking the ball. Okay, so this is the racket hand can strike the table only after uh, striking the ball. So this is the answer of this question. Okay, thank okay, you. Okay, we much. we told about this in our presentation before. Yeah. Okay. Um, here we have one from James Liu. Uh, will those who pass the exam receive a certificate? That is a very good question because any one of those who were passing already have the certificate uploaded into the Moodle platform. So you already have your user and your password. So you are able to go there and already the certificates are there. I'm checking some more questions. OK, this could be a good one because we were talking about a table a rackets when you break one racket and is from Cynthia Quavi when a player in a wheelchair damage his or her wheelchair and doesn't have any spare one, what happens, especially those coming from developing countries? <laughs> how, many witch, how many wheels has the wheelchair? <laughs> okay, how many wheels has the wheelchair? <laughs> so let's, let's say that... So you, if it has less than three wheels, he cannot play, unfortunately. <laughs> Okay, okay, let's say that one with two big and one small and another one with two big and two small. Yeah, if it has two big, one small and one is broken, he cannot play anymore. And if he doesn't have another one, I'm sorry, he cannot continue. But if he could manage to continue with the other one who with four wheels and he can play with three wheels, then he can continue the match. Otherwise, I don't know, <laughs> nothing, <laughs> nothing to do. So, so okay. Tina, just, just to confirm that a player can change wheelchairs. If, if his wheelchair gets damaged so badly that he can't use it, he's, he can change into his, another wheelchair that he's got or a friend's wheelchair. Yeah, of course, with another one. But if he doesn't, and, this and, is and that, that he's from a development was, country and he doesn't have another wheelchair, if I understand uh, correct the question. And it, that will be in the next uh, single match, or it can be in the same match to change the wheelchair to for an, one of the friends one. The same, he can change even the same match. Okay, good. So we slowly are coming uh, to the time we are already there, and many questions were coming, many questions were answered. Um, just as a wrapping up, the international umpire exam was until 2020 in one way and from 2020 in a different way. Before, we were not used to the masks. Now, we need to get used to the masks. So, different times, different ways. So, this will include online examination and also refreshments. The para table tennis is important not only for those who usually officiate in para events, but for any match officials, 
as it will be compulsory to officiate in para events to have the active status. It's important to know in deep the laws and regulations to read the full question and each one of the answers and not thinking about things that are not written on it. Thanks to both panelists for taking the time to share with us. And also thank you very much to all our friends that did the International Empire exam this year for your attention and contribution today. Your participation in the exam, and if you were successful, as I already said, you can download already your certificate in the Moodle platform. Also, thank you very much to the remaining participants that were uh, not doing the International Empire this year. Next webinar will be next uh, uh, will be August 10th, Monday, at 2 p.m. Central European Summer Time, with the topic data analytics and artificial intelligence in table tennis with Mega Gambir from Stupa Sport Analytics, the CEO and co-founder and a management professional and technologist working on data and video analytics and artificial intelligence in sports. Thank you very much to everyone. Have a nice day and a nice rest. Mr. Roman. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Roman. Goodbye. Thank you. Mr. Roman.